live. All right, we're live. So we want to welcome you online, whether it's YouTube or Facebook. We're glad you're with us today. And uh, today's title is going to be Enduring Hardships. But before we go to there, I'll just say, if you wanted to give an offering, you can. Many of you know how to do this. You can go to the in-house offering box in the foyer, or you can go to amanacf.org. You can give that way as well. So I want to tell you about that. And uh, again, we're talking about enduring hardships today. And I'm going to preface this by saying that uh, this, this is one of those teachings that I really, I, I've said this many times, I'm not just saying it, I really don't really know how to teach this, which is a good thing. That's a good thing. I mean, it really is a good thing. I, I'm going to try not to get in the way of what God wants to do today, but I'm going to tell you, the Lord has shown me something. He has shown me something uh, with this, and it is real special. But here's the thing. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. And I can't teach things that are spiritual. You understand? Human intellect and human ability can't teach spiritual things. It, it, is, it is absolutely imperative that Christ have his way with this. If, if, I'm telling you, if we don't receive the thoughts of God on this topic, we'll, th this thing will be taught and they'll say, I, I, I didn't get it. I, or we'll walk out and say, that, that, that wasn't too good. Or like T. Joe says, it's it over my head. T. Joe says he loses one hair. Every time a message goes over his head. That's what he said in front of the whole church. That's why I can say it. I'm not picking on it. He said it, not me. <laughs> and I lose a centimeter of height every time something goes over my head. <laughs> so I used to be really tall. <laughs> oh, man. This is tough. This is hard to teach. But it's so wonderful. It's, this is... This teaching today, I, I feel like it'll go from spiritual to natural to spiritual. It's just, it's just incredible. But let's begin with in Matthew 6, the famous seek first the kingdom passage, and these things will be added. We always assume that these things are the natural things. We always assume that this is a Seek the kingdom first. Seek the spiritual stuff first, and God will take care of the natural stuff. And he will. He will. But I think even when Jesus says that, the these things are actually spiritual things. They're actually spiritual things. And I don't know how to connect that to you, but it has been connected to me. I'm telling you now, the, the Lord has connected that to me. He has given me an understanding. But see, he doesn't give me an understanding in English. He doesn't give me an understanding with words at all. It's an understanding. I don't know how to say it. Did anyone teach you what your name was? Or did you just understand what your name was? You see, that it's, some things aren't taught. Some things aren't taught. Like they're not formally taught or structurally built into your understanding. Some things are. The things of this world are, and they can be. We can learn the foundation of things and then build upon that, and we can teach and we can grow certain things. But when it comes to the spiritual things, it's not like that. That's how humans learn. That's how humans gain understanding. But... We're talking spiritual things here. And the spirit doesn't necessarily operate that way. What's it? The first John 2 says that you need no man to teach you, but the anointing who lives in you will teach you all things. And just as it has taught you, remain in him. First John 2, 20 something through 20 something. It is written. Right? So sometimes. And it's wonderful when this happens. But it's, 
It, it's a little difficult when you're the pastor, but you get an understanding from God, but you can't present it the way it was given because there was no structure to how it was given. So where does that leave me? Complete dependency. Just like Faye. Complete dependency. And it leaves you in the same place. And my hope is that God will reveal things to you that you can't repeat. But as surely as I know my name, I'm telling you, he showed me something with this. And in Matthew 6, it is, let's see, Matthew 6. Let, let me join you, let me join you there. Verse, we're going to go with verse 24. We'll start in 24. And just know that I may not read every verse in this passage. I know sometimes people get upset. He should have read this verse, but I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to go with things as they should go. I'm not, I'm not obligated to reading a whole passage. I, I'm trying to strip back preconceived ideologies about how things should be to make more room for God to establish how things should be. Okay, so I'm not obligated to reading every detail and explaining everything. I'm not obligated. And I'm not sorry about that. I'm, I'm obligated to let Christ establish what he wants to establish. But I want to begin in verse 24. And Jesus says, No man or no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We're going to have to We'll have to stop here. I'm going to leave that screen right there, please. Perfect. See, you heard me say that we would talk about seek the kingdom first, and these things will be added, and we jump into this passage. If you have your Bible with you, you'll see that it kind of seems like it's changing subjects after this verse, but it is not. This passage leads into the next one. They are the same. The word money there, did you know, is not money. This is not about money. This is about treasure. The actual definition is the treasure that a person trusts in. So the translators assume that to be money. And it certainly can be money. But it's not limited to money. They use the Aramaic word for, 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 for money, but the word study is the treasure that a person trusts in. I kid you not. That's, that's the word there. Guys, he's saying that you cannot serve both God and anything else that you're trusting in. You can't trust in God and in self, by the way. This is a spiritual emphasis. This is not about your house note, though God is concerned about that too. This is not the emphasis. This is saying that you can't serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other. And I don't think it's saying all the time. I think it's saying in any given moment, you're either loving one or you're loving the other. I think if you lean to self, if you depend on self for the spiritual things, I think in that moment, your love for God is not right. Amen. Your trust for God is not right. It does not mean that you as an individual do not love God. That is not what we are saying. I would prefer for you not to label yourself as a believer that 
trust God or trust self. I would rather you, I would rather you in the moment, every moment, identify which of those you are. That's better because I know that you want to trust God. I know that though I would like to label myself as one who trusts God, there are moments where I do not. It would be better to identify from moment to moment if we're loving God appropriately or if we're loving self or if we're trusting the treasure that we find in self concerning God's ways or if we're trusting the treasure of Christ in us when it comes to the Father's ways. He says you cannot do both at the same time. One has got to be zero and one has got to be a hundred, Charlie. You're right. One is a hundred, one is zero. And this is the case. In any given moment, I know in your, as your life as a whole, it is not zero in a hundred. I understand there are moments, but you have to know that in any given moment, God desires your complete trust for the spiritual things. Let me say it this way. You have the Father. We have the Father. And the Father has thoughts. The Father will say it this way. He, he has words to speak and he has deeds to act. And we have the Son who says he never speaks unless he hears the Father speak and says he never acts unless he sees the Father act. And we see that the Son is the exact representation of the Father. It's not because he looked like him. It's not because he had his daddy's nose or his eyes. No. Quit relating to God based on human understanding. He was the exact representation of the Father because he took the Father's words and allowed the Father to speak them through the Son. It's as though the very life and work of the Father was at work through Jesus. It's exactly what it was. The Father's words and the Father's deeds were spoken and they were acted through the Son. And Jesus says, now I'm going to go make a way for you to be where I am with that. And here's the difference. Jesus says that the Spirit will not speak on his own, but that he will take from Jesus. Well, what does Jesus take from? The Father. Now we see how they're one. They're not one as in they're all the exact same. No. They're one in that they are aligned perfectly to perfection. And what causes this? What causes this per perfect alignment? It's that Jesus did not look to himself as the treasure he trusted in. He looked at the Father as the treasure he trusted in. See, he wasn't serving both God and, as this says, money, but it's not really translated correctly. He wasn't serving both the Father and the treasure of self. Philippians 2 says he made himself nothing and that we ought to do the same, Paul says. So the Father represents himself perfectly through the Son. And the Son represents the Father perfectly to the Spirit. And the Spirit in you desires to represent the Son and the Father perfectly through us. But if we are found trusting the treasure of self to do this, we are in the way and we are denying Christ the right to represent the Father through us. This is the how, how he wants to make us one with him. It's not just through salvation. In that moment, you are perfectly one with him. But this, the moment we begin to trust in self for the spiritual things, we lose that connection, that oneness, though we are still saved and though he is still with us. 
but we are not postured or approached properly for him to make the Father known to us. So the believer, when you were born again, what happened to your first birth? Nothing. It's still there. It didn't go away. We call it first birth and second birth. I've been calling it left side, right side. First birth, second birth. A little bit easier to understand, honestly. When you were born of your mother's womb, that was your first birth. When you were born of Christ, that was your second birth. One was natural, one was spiritual. So if you've been born of the Spirit, guess what? You didn't lose your first birth. It's still there. In fact, we go to the doctor to make sure it sticks around even longer. Right? So here's the deal. You got treasure in you. You got two treasures in you. You have the treasure of God. And you have the treasure, it says money here, but the treasure of whatever you're trusting in. And I'm going to tell you itself. You have the treasure of the second birth versus the treasure of the first birth. And we're just talking about the things concerning God. We're only talking about the things concerning God. We're talking about the part of you that says, I want to grow as a Christian. I want to fulfill the Great Commission. I want to bear the fruits of Christ. Or the fruit of Christ. I want the spiritual giftings at work in me. I want the ministry that God has for me to come alive. I want to be, let's just make it simple. I want to be more like Jesus. I mean, are you at church for any other reason than that, honestly? I mean, is it safe to say that if you're here, you probably desire to be more like Jesus? Right? That's not to say that if you're not here, you don't. I'm saying if you're here, it's obvious that there's something in you that desires to be like Jesus. Okay, so that's understood. All right, we can't say that about everybody in the world. We're not talking about the world. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you. This church doesn't put a lot of emphasis on the world. This is, I guess, we're a discipleship church, I guess. I guess we're making disciples of all men, baptizing them or immersing them into the identity or name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're trying to get the believer to immerse themselves into the identity of God, that God will make his identity known through the believer, that the believer will be baptized or overwhelmed with the identity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, making themselves known through you. That's the Great Commission, by the way. So we're talking about this isn't going anywhere like I thought it would go. We're, we're talking about the believer who desires to be like Christ. Thank you, Lord, for making that simple. We know there are many facets in that. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's the gifts of the Spirit. There's the fivefold ministry. There's the, the, let me tell you, you start getting caught up in the details. And you'll begin to structurally teach yourself about a detail of Christ and miss the rest of Christ. And the rest in Christ. <laughs> a little bit of a wordplay, but true. You'll miss everything. And even the thing that you think you have, the detail, you'll lose that too. Anyone who has will be given. Anyone who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken from him. Jaden said it great. We're not filling in those blanks. You desire to be like Christ. And in you is a first birth and a second birth. In your pursuit of, Christ, of being like Christ, when we trust in one, 
whether it's first birth or second birth, whichever one we're trusting in, in any given moment and being more like Christ, we are despising the other. You cannot serve both of those masters. You'll either love one and despise the other. And we all do it. We all lean toward that first birth. And this is the very thing that Jesus is talking about when he says, repent and believe. When you find yourself leaning on the first birth, to become more like Christ, we change our mind about that and we trust Christ. That's what repent and believe means. Metadoyeo and pistuo. It means change your mind and entrust him. Guys, when that's grasped in the believer, every detail about Christ is positioned to come alive as he, being the Lord, determines the times and circumstances to reveal them. That's the glory of God. That's on earth as it is in heaven. I I, I don't know if I can repeat that. That was really well said. I don't know how that was said, but that was really well said. But we need to be postured in such a way of trust that any detail that Christ wants to reveal of the Father... He's getting it from the Father. He's still doing it, guys. Any detail, he now can bring that about. Because there's an invitation of the believer, and you want to know how you invite Christ? You trust him. You know how you trust him? You give up on self. When it becomes obvious to you that you are not Christ-like, Instead of panicking and trying to restore that, turn to Christ and say, Lord, I now realize what you already knew about me. That in this moment, in this area, I'm not like you. Why has the church been taught to be ashamed of that? Jesus died on the cross naked to take away your shame. If you're guilty about your sin, that's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which is a change of mind. Worldly sorrow leads to condemnation. Worldly sorrow, the part of you that was born of this world, the first birth, it can't measure up and it condemns over and over and over again, and then we go try to restore it and fix it, and we're condemned. And, and, and listen, if you're, if, if you're guilty and ashamed, it's because you're guilty and ashamed because you expected your first birth to do better concerning being Christ-like. And that's the problem. And that's the worldly sorrow that will continue to leave you frustrated, fruitlessly frustrated. But godly sorrow is when we say, I'm not ashamed that I can't be more Christ-like. I don't feel guilty that I can't be more Christ-like. I don't. I rejoice. Here's the suffering. I rejoice at my inability to be Christ-like. I don't know how many pastors get up and say that. I'm not trying to impress you, church. This is not going the way I thought it would go. But I am not trying to impress anyone at how Christ-like I can be. I rejoice at my inability to be Christ-like. You know why I rejoice? Because when I realize I cannot be Christ-like, you know what I realize? I finally realize what God already knew about me. And then, and only then, can I fully turn to Christ to say, instead of me trying to mimic your life, instead of me trying to mimic your life and show the world a counterfeit model of Christ, 
Lord, why don't you who are the real thing, why don't you reveal your very life through me? Because if you do that, I'm going to look real Christ-like. I mean, do you want to see the Elvis impersonator or do you want to see Elvis? Right? I mean, come on. Right? You know, we talk about stolen identities in this day and age. There's a whole lot of stolen identity of Christ. Even the world knows this can't work, guys. We're on live, so I can't say any products, I don't think. I don't know how that works. But if you want to, even the world knows this is wrong. If I take a product, go try to manufacture it, Make it taste like the, the real thing. And it'll taste anything close to it. But you can kind of tell it's, it's attempting to. But yet I take the label of the real thing, put it around there, and tell the whole world this is the real thing and sell it. You know I get sued for that, right? You know, you, you, you go to, like, you lose everything for that. So the world knows that it's wrong to take a counterfeit, put the label of the real thing on it, and present it that way. Everybody knows that's wrong. But yet Christians are taught to do it. Behave like Christ. And call it the work of Christ. Slap his label around that. Tell the world, and you wonder why they're not interested in your religion. The Father is not interested in my performance. He's interested in the performance of his Son in me. And you cannot love both God and whatever treasure you're trusting in, which is self. You're either going to despise one and love the other. The father said, this is my son in whom I am pleased with. And then he said this on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John see the glory of of God. And Peter's first instinct, Peter, Lord, let me build. You saw the glory of God. Remember when you were born again? You remember the glory of God? And then man began to teach you how to build. Build a house for Jesus. Build, build, build yourself up in such a way that Christ can be housed in there. Remember that? Took me about 20 years to realize that ain't going to work. God does not live in things built by human hands. He doesn't come alive, Christian, in the believers that are building with human hands. Peter immediately, let me build a house. And the Father says... This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then he says this, listen to him. Peter, stop trying to perform. Watch and listen for the performance of Christ. I'm telling you, Jesus will do more from your nothingness than you can ever imagine. God is good at creating from nothing. In fact, the first six days of time, he did a bunch. 
he did a whole lot of something from nothing. A lot. Your very existence of, of humanity came from nothing. So take all your Bible knowledge, all your prayer time, all your church attendance, keep it up. Great. We need to do those things. They are posturing us to hear from God. That's great. But put it all right there before him and say, Lord, as good as all that is, unless you come alive in it, it remains lifeless. I cannot bring the things of God to life. The Father came alive in Jesus on the third day, didn't he? Jesus was lying at rest. Jesus never took it upon himself to do something for the Father. And yet Christians are taught to do something for God. Because we do not believe, we do not believe that Christ will do something for the Father in us and he will orchestrate things that we can never imagine. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has perceived what the, 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 the things that, that God wants to accomplish in those who love him. But I'm going to tell you, it is very difficult to believe this because your first birth didn't go anywhere. It's very difficult to believe this. We must trust Christ over self. We haven't got to the Bible reading passage yet. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read it a little bit of it. This is so amazing to me. It's verse twenty five. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. Leave it right there, verse 25. We're not getting past this. We're not going past this. When I read this, I have always read this because of what it says later, but seek first the kingdom and these things will be added. It's true. Let me begin by saying the way you just read that, 99% of you just read that as a first birth provision. Food. Clothes. Your body. Drink. Drink. We just read that, and we probably read it from a first birth provision. I'm going to tell you it's not wrong. That's true. God will provide these things. He will. But I'm also going to tell you that when Jesus said this, he was not thinking first birth provision because of the Greek words that are used here for life. This word life here is not bio. Bio is bodily life. It, that's not the word for life there. That word is used in scripture. You remember the parable of the seed and the sower? Where he says that for the worries, he says that there's a seed that fell among the thorns. And he said that the worries and cares of this life will choke the seed, and now the seed is Christ, Christ in you. The worries and cares of this life will choke the seed out. That word is bio. He's saying the things that you worry about in your first birth, your provision, your care, your, these things can choke out the life and work of Christ in the believer. But that's not the word used here. 
That's not the word used here. This is suke. Who said suke? He's so smart. Boy, that girl is something. Good looking and smart. Uh uh. Suke. This is the soul realm. Jesus, man, can you, this is radical. Jesus is saying, do not worry even about your soul. Now, certainly we should, everybody in here desires to be Christ-like. In that manner, we all have that. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying don't desire that. He's saying don't put so much of your care into that. What you, if he's talking about the soul of a man, and, and now we know, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But the makeup, I'm going to try to keep it real simple, but the makeup of a, of a believer is he has this vessel in him. We call it the soul. Okay? And it, and it, it has a desire. If you're born again, it has a desire to be Christ-like. Okay? On the... I'm going to use left and right. It's not really that way. But on the left side, we have self, first birth. On the right side, we have the spirit, Christ in us. And both are warring to fill this soul for the things of God. So the suitcase is kind of like a suitcase. It could be packed with either one. And Jesus is saying, first birth, don't you worry about that suke. We're going to let the right hand do what it wants to do and not concern the left hand with what the right hand's doing. We're going to let the second birth do things that the first birth of the left hand knows nothing about. Now, you want to be focused on the first birth concerning the spiritual things? Many who are first will be last. You wanna, or you want to let the second birth do it. Many who are last will be first. Oh, we see the teachings of Christ coming alive. When it comes to the soul realm, first birth, get your hands off of it. Get out of it. You know the way John the Baptist said it? He said, make straight a way for the Lord. Get out of the way so the Lord can come in. Get to nothing so the Lord can fill it. So I tell you, do not worry about your suke, flesh, self, goat, chaff, darkness, deceit, world. Get out of the way so that the truth, the spirit, the wheat, the sheep, the Lord, spiritual, can come in and represent the Father. Do not worry about your soul, life, flesh, what you will spiritually eat. Do not concern yourself, first birth, with spiritual eat. Do not concern yourself, first birth, with spiritual drink. Do not concern yourself, first birth, with spiritual body embodiment of what that's going to look like. Do not concern yourself, first birth, with what you will wear clothed in Christ. Quit thinking you, first birth, can put on the armor of Christ. Are you out of your mind? You can put on a counterfeit armor of Christ, but the armor of Christ, first birth, do not concern yourself with that. You see, we've been trained to think when we can't get spiritual eating, we can't get spiritual drink, we can't get spiritual embodiment right, and we can't get spiritually clothed right, that we should feel ashamed and we should feel guilty. And God's saying, I'm waiting for you to quit feeling ashamed about that and to recognize what I already know about you, and to own it. Because then we can go to the, real, to, to the real thing here, 
and we can finally give up and surrender on worrying about it from the first birth, getting so caught up in shame and guilt that you go try harder next time. We can get past that and just accept what God already knows about you. And what the very scriptures are trying to tell you. And now they can finally say, Lord, I actually rejoice that I can't do it. Because now I get to look to the one who can do it. And when he does it, guess what happens? Guess what happens? You experience him. Oh, what happens when you experience him? You love him. And you know him. You experience him, and you know him, and you love him, and it makes you rejoice at your insufficiencies. You know what it does in regards to this? Listen to this scripture, Paul. I've learned the contentment of being well-fed or being hungry, being clothed or being naked. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation. Think about that in regards to this, being fed. This is spiritual, guys. He says, here's the secret of being content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's saying, I could be content when I'm spiritually naked. I could be content when I'm spiritually not fed hungry because Christ can strengthen me Christ in me you can't put your trust in the treasure of self and put your trust in the treasure of God you'll either love one and despise the other yes I know what some of you are thinking Paul really did go naked Paul really did go hungry. Absolutely true, but it's not the emphasis of what he's talking about. I'm telling you, I think Paul was a pretty spiritually minded guy. I think he was. And though it's true that Jesus is saying you can trust God for your bread and you can trust God for your clothes, I, I, I know that to be true, but I think Jesus was pretty spiritual too. And in fact, he even spoke in parables often, and this could even be one. Just because the Bible doesn't call it a par- the man didn't write parable above it doesn't mean it's not one. Understand that many things are spoken in the natural for the purpose of hiding the spiritual truth to those who think they understand something. You know what David said? Oh, Kim, why don't you come help me close? I'm, I'm closing. I'm closing. I'm, I'm, I am doing this. But listen to what David said. Who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Christians think we can diagnose our spiritual well-being and figure out where we're doing well and where we're doing bad. and You don't even know. It's worse than we thought. <laughs> we, we, it's better than what we thought because it's worse than what we thought. If you can keep up. I don't know if you can keep up with that. but Guys, the worse we are, the better it is because the more we can rely on Christ and the more we get to experience Christ and the more we get to know Christ. You don't even know. You don't even know the extent of how unchristlike we are. God forbid us Spiritually assess ourselves and say, well, this is the only, this is where I got to get, if I can get this, I'm good. And never long for Christ in all of this. That's right. right. Apart from me, I never knew you. I never, you never experienced me. You never let me come in and Reveal myself to you. You despised me. You denied me the right to represent the Father because you loved the treasure in which you trusted in to do it, and it was self. The very thing I said to carry your cross and crucify, 
and remove that. Get that out of the way. Trust me. Guys, if you're at the point of giving up, you're finally there. If you're almost at the point of giving up, then you're almost right where you need to be to really trust Christ. And I'm talking about giving up on self. When you fully give up on self, for the first time, you can fully trust Christ. If you kind of give it up on self, then you kind of trust Christ. But if you're at the point where you're saying, I'm becoming really, really convinced that I cannot be Christ-like, then you're becoming really, really convinced that you can trust Christ to do it. And he's going to represent the Father in you. He's going to reveal the Father to you. John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. He's saying, I've overcome that flesh part of you. We didn't get to the main passage today. It's in Hebrews. May it get there, but may not one day. I don't know. But that was what the title, Enduring Hardships, was from Hebrews 12. Homework assignment. Love you guys. Let's laugh and pray. I want to thank you family of Dakota and Renee for coming and be with us, fellowship with us today. I was like, look at Stacy. Had to get up early today, Stacy. I know how that goes. I love, I love that family so much. You guys are so special to me. I love Pastor Terrell and Miss Debbie. Thank you all for joining us today. They live a long ways from here. Y'all make sure and give them a hug while you got them. Because they, they may not be back for a while. They, they live a long ways from here. It's a long drive. So, Lord, we just love you and thank you. You know, I thank you, Lord, for offering yourself to us. That is so good, Lord Jesus. You, you offer your life to us. You're offering to come alive in us. Oftentimes we talk about how Jesus died for us. And that's true, Lord. We know you died for us. But we want you to live for us too. You died for us so that you can now live for us. You were resurrected so that you can live for us. You want to live the Father's things out in us. Or teach us to make straight a way for you to do so to get out of the way so that you can come through and we love you Lord amen bless you guys see y'all Wednesday night it's gonna be fun alright